Welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 358 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited that you are here and excited that you get to join me in a conversation that's a little bit different. Uh, I went into this interview not knowing too much about my guest story, and that was intentional. And that is because I really wanted to unpack this story as it went, to follow the story rather than going in with set questions or set ideas of what it could be and then shaping it from there. I really wanted to follow this, especially as this person is a newer runner, especially as this person had struggled with his uh, image, the way that he saw himself, had grown up in the spotlight his whole life. I really felt like this was a very important episode um, to just get to know the human underneath. And you're going to hear just this beautiful evolution that running has been a part of with my guest today. So I'm very excited to welcome Colson Smith to the episode today. Uh, and Colson, you may know if you are uh, in the UK as Craig Tinker from Coronation Street. Uh, well, this is a show that I grew up watching. My parents still watch it or my mum still watches it. Um, it is, you're going to hear a bit about what Coronation Street means to the UK. But Craig has been in the show for a long time. He was nominated for Best Young Actor at the 2015 Inside Soap Awards. Um, and today, while we talk a little bit about acting, we talk a little bit about his podcast, Sofa Cinema Club, which our very own, uh, Running For Real's very own, uh, Sally loves Sofa Cinema Club, which is how she knew about Colson's journey with running. But we wanted to focus on that side of running, especially as Colson was someone who would have never seen himself as a runner. So let's go meet Colson and get to know his story. Oh, friends, I am so excited to welcome Precision Fuel and Hydration to the Running For Real podcast. They are our brand new sponsor. I have been using these products for months, but as with me, I always want to check things out, make sure I like them, make sure I love them before I suggest them to you. So Precision Fuel was the only fuel that I consumed during my uh, ultra marathon. I did a I did have a few bites of other real food items around the way, but this was the only gel that I took, the only uh, electrolytes that I took. So I want to tell you a bit about them today. So I loved taking the Precision Fuel. Um, as I said, I exclusively used it in my Bryce Canyon 50 mile ultra, which I won and finished fourth overall time ever for women in on that course. It was a very good race. Um, and within that, I took their gels, which have 30 grams of carbs, which is the most efficient way to get that into your system fast. Uh, the gels have this very mild neutral taste so you don't get fed up of the flavor and I had no problem continuing to take them uh, the texture is really easy to go down there's a lot of gels I don't like and this went down so easily so you don't need to drink with them they also have chews which I love the lemon and mint which I love that combination there of flavors where you you get two gels in each pouch you can, uh, you know, I took two bites within each each chew, took them down, went down easily. I alternated between the two. There's also a caffeinated version if you are interested. And I am excited to welcome Precision to the Running For Real podcast. So if you use the code Tina sent me to your car at precisionfuelandhydration.com, you are going to be able to get a 15% off discount. You can also go to precisionfuelandhydration.com forward slash Tina, and that will add your code automatically to the cart. Uh, beyond that, Precision is actually also offering a free fuel and nutrition, fuel and hydration, I should say, planner that well, they can use to understand how much carb, fluid and sodium you need to perform at your best in your key runs. You can uh, visit the links in the show notes to go get that free planner. And they also give you free video consultations with their athlete support crew. This is absolutely free. There is a link in the show notes to go get that consultation scheduled. I highly recommend you check it out. But again, go to precisionfuelandhydration.com forward slash Tina to go find out more. 
Colson, welcome to your first appearance on a running podcast on the Running Through a Podcast. I'm excited that you were here. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Who'd have thought it on a running podcast? <laughs> what would 10 year old Colson say about being on a running podcast? What would 10 year old Colson say about if podcasts exist when Colson was 10? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. What would Colson have said? Not sure, really. I, 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 I just don't think it, it would have ever related with him because I, well, running for me was always seemed as that like punishment in school. You know, like um, the worst part of sports day or cross country. <laughs> and I, I vividly remember writing a note and folding it the way my mum used to fold letters and taking it to my PE teacher that said, "Colson can't do." cross country because he's hurt his foot and I had my trainers in my bag <laughs> and I wore my trainers with my school uniform to like back up my injury excuse so it was like something that I always avoided so to think you know I'm, I'm not sure 10 year old Colson would would believe it at all can I tell you something though we just were speaking a few minutes before this started and you know a little bit about my past in running and people, you wouldn't know this, but people who've listened to this, who listen to this podcast regularly definitely know this. People often think that someone like who is like me has run for Great Britain, you know, very fast uh, in my past times. I actually hid in the toilets when they were doing the, like, see in the US they'd call them tryouts. I don't know what you'd call, what we would have called them back then, but like basically when they were picking who they wanted on the cross country team, I hid in the toilets. So I wasn't actually like, let's go running either, which I think people often think would be the case. So um, is that it's kind you of were funny hearing you say that. Embarrassed that you were good at it. I think that was before I realized I was good at it. I think at that point, as you know, and actually you're the perfect person. Wait, how old are you? 24. 24. Okay. So you're, you're a decade younger than me, but still I always say to people that like when I was, I don't know if things have changed now, but when I was a teenager, running was the most embarrassing thing to do. And I would run at night so that I minimized the amount of people that would see me in running clothes. Um, and so at that point, while I don't think I re knew I was good at it, I think it was more a case of like, my friends said, this isn't cool. Like, this is stupid. I don't like this. And so I automatically thought, I, this is stupid. I don't want to do this. And I, I can't remember, but maybe subconsciously there was a part of me that knew I was good at it. And that's why I hid because I didn't want to like reveal myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It was definitely something to do with my friends, like not wanting to be, dare say like, oh, I actually quite like this or I'm quite good at this, I think, but I'm not sure. I wish I could go back and find out, but all I know is I definitely hit, but then somehow found myself on the team. So somewhere along the way, I ended up on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you wrote notes to get out of PE. You are now on a running podcast. You just had a really exciting, and I'm going to call you out before we go any further, because I've heard you actually, I also heard you saying you felt guilty for feeling this way. Um, you just ran your first marathon. Congratulations. Yeah. Huge accomplishment. Um, but you also said that you were disappointed with the time, which was three hours, 44, which is a solid first marathon. Very much so. And I really mean that. And I know people, when they hear me say that, they're like, Oh, mm, it's okay for you to say that. <laughs> but really like three forty-four is very, very impressive. Um, but I am curious why you needed a time to really feel like you could be, pr why you needed a certain time, which for you was under 3.30, to feel like you could really be proud of it. Or have you since processed that? I think it was because a marathon was like always something that I, as soon as I started running, it's like, it's, it's the pinnacle, isn't it? Of like goal mm. setting of being able to mm. do a marathon and doing it at the time. And the way, the way I kind of have been on my running journey is it's always been about bettering myself and getting better at, you know, the actual fundamentals of running as well as enjoy the more I enjoy it. So I think when I set out on the marathon, I was like, 
yeah, I'll, I'll see how I go. And then in the training, I was like, yeah, this has just been like every other run that I've gone on and I, I will be able to just do it at this time. And I'd kind of had in my head that no one is expecting me to run this under three and a half hours. And I was like, and I think I should probably be able to come in at about 318. So I kind of mm-hmm. had had that in my head and I hadn't set a time deliberately because I was like, I'm not going to say a time because I don't want to put pressure on myself to do it. But I was like, but that's what I want to get. And I think it'll be that, n- not just the vanity factor, but it'll be like, I really didn't see him doing that. And boy, he he can run. He's not just, you know, he's, he's not just doing it to lose weight in lockdown anymore. Mm-hmm. It, it is a thing sort of thing. So I think that's where that kind of pressure came from. And then there was a point of me when I was actually running. And as soon as it, cause I kind of, I, the, the run went, it got messy at like 34 K and part of me was like, Oh, that's really annoying. Cause like it was, it was, it was going perfect. And now I was mm. like, Oh, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen now. <laughs> I wonder what percentage of runners say that at that point, 34 K is you said 34 K you felt that. Yeah. 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 So that's what, 23 miles, roughly 20, 22 to 24, somewhere in their miles. Yeah. Um, and obviously as all marathoners though, that is the most painful point in the race. Um, but I'm, I really want to, if you're comfortable, I really want to like dig into this a little bit in terms of, okay, let's step back. There was a reason, or, or maybe not the reason you started running. Um, let's come back to your marathon in a minute. But you, um, we haven't mentioned it up to this point, but there is a reason that a lot of people are watching what you're doing. Um, you have a lot of eyes on you. You have a lot of people paying attention to you. You have the unfortunate situation of clickbaity articles being yeah. made about you. Um, so can you maybe give us a little background for someone as there is going to be a lot of American listeners as well as maybe English listeners who don't know you as Colson. Um, yeah. why, why was, why was there so much attention on you in the first place? Yeah. So I, I, from the age of like 10, I said to my parents, I want to be an actor. And they were like, good luck with that. Let us know what <laughs> you're going to do, but good luck with it. <laughs> and then from the age of 11 onwards, I kind of started this career as a jobbing child actor and from 12, I got a regular part in a English soap um, called Coronation Street. And it's it's the longest running TV show in the country. And it's almost like a bit of a national institution in England. Oh, like it's, absolutely. It, it's, I, I, have, um, I, I went to drama school for a bit in America. And when they clicked on that, I actually like had a job there and they were like what is it that you do and i don't know why this is what i said as an 18 year old i was like it's a bit like dallas but the english version <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so basically I, I i'm on a tv show in england which is you know it, it's a show that i'm very proud to be a part of and i and i grew up in the public eye because of that and i kind of grew up as this character that was just known for being the the chubby lad off the telly sort of thing and, and wait that's you haven't it, even said the name of the show yet Coronation Street Coronation Street okay Coronation so you Street. Were, sorry you were known as keep going um, yeah so, so <laughs> and I play a character called Craig Tinker which you know when I first started I, I was kind of there just as this this chubby young character and that's kind of what I grew up and I, I I knew what my role in the show was completely even even in jobs previous to Cory you know that, that they were always the characters that I played. Um, but then I grew up with that and kind of developed and the, the character became, you know, a, a long-term resident of the street. Um, so, yeah, but that meant growing up in the public eye, which, you know, was not particularly easy. Yeah, and I have to go back a second here. When you said about, you know, brought on in this role, like what, do you remember any of the wording? Like you said that you were kind of brought on as this chubby kid. Like what, um, did they, when they were kind of saying to you, this is Craig, this is who he is. Like did, what kind of words were people giving you? Like, was it feeding into that 
way you looked as yourself and you said you'd had previous roles like this, like, oh, this is just who I am. Or this is just like, you know how you see some actors who always play the same kind of role? Yeah. And um, was that kind of made clear to you through wording of when, I don't know, whoever the director or whatever the person is called uh, would talk to you about your space in, in Coronation Street? Interestingly, for Craig, it, it was very different because I remember when mm. the casting brief came through, the o- the only words were unique between the ages of nine and 13. So the casting brief was just unique and that age. So Oof. I guess my my unique bit was that I was fat and ginger and, you know, looked. I did look different to everybody else in school. But I remember being sat in the like waiting room and there was six of our lads who were also going for the audition and not one of us looked the same. Like there was lads of different ethnicity, completely different backgrounds. There was, there was posh kids that it, it was, it was a, it was really different. It was quite an open cast. And so I, I don't mm. think Corey quite knew what they were, you know, going mm. out for, but they did, they, they wanted a bit of a, you know, they wanted a unique character to match this eccentric mum. Because you know when my, it was, it was I, I was just coming as a sideline to my mum, who was a date for someone. That that was the story. Um, mm. And for for the two eps I came in, I was completely non-speaking. So it, it was just there as you know a visual statement. Um, okay. And then I think it was more the time when I, when I came back. So like I say, the, the first contract at Corey was literally two episodes, and then about eight months after that, they kind of got in touch with my agent and said look, we, we really liked what we saw and we, we kind of plan on bringing them in as a family if if he'd be interested. And it came, it kind okay. of stayed and I was kind of this mute visual gag that, you know, I, I, was it at my own expense? I don't know. But when I started to understand it was when I started to make it work better and then actually work for me as well. But um, yeah, so the... the the Cory brief was very different to the others because, like, I, 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 my first ever talking job, I'm sure, I'm sure the brief was like "fat kid," and my lines were, um, "Do you get bullied too?" And the response was, "No, some we're not fat." So, literally, from from a very yeah. early age, I was <laughs> I was exposed to being a gag in the industry, which at the time I didn't realise, and I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone quite did. But I know because my mum had kind of brought it up with me at one point, like mm. when I got older. And she was like, probably isn't, you know, she was like, I don't quite think you're, anyone's aware of what's going on because it was a completely different industry for them as well. So it, mm. it, 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 was, it was very weird. But I have to say, out of all the jobs that I've done, Corey managed that a hell of a lot better than anywhere else. Mm. So with that, that they, they handled it better and then um, other program shows maybe not so much but now you reflect back on it especially the, with this journey that you've been on are you seeing parts of how it did affect your psyche especially as you said being a child growing up with articles being written about you and you know we see it don't we like I mean Meghan Markle and Prince Harry are the best example of this of how intensely the media and especially I've said this many times on this uh, this podcast about I uh, trying to explain the UK media in particular are harsh yeah. really harsh yeah. and so um like what did that do to your psyche and and what you thought about who you were as you were growing up in like the most pivotal years of your life yeah, it, it was it was weird because as a child, really, um, there wasn't too much like that. The press didn't say anything particularly about the way I looked as a child. But the place that there was mm-hmm. stuff said was like Twitter and online, because obviously mm-hmm. the show was watched by like ten million people. And as a thirteen-year-old, I remember going on and searching my name in Twitter to what people were saying about my acting and about the character. Mm-hmm. And what I found Ouch. was stuff about the way that I look. So I think. I, that that was probably the more difficult thing. And then when I turned 17, I kind of left education and Corey was my full-time job. And I kind of started to learn more about myself. And I I lost weight initially then. And because I lost weight, it meant the press could then talk about the fact that I'd lost weight. And then when I went and put the weight back on twofold, it kind of went 
both ways. So it was kind yeah. of that then it, it from, so probably from 18 onwards, it was very much that my, my weight was quite a feature of who I was in terms of, you know, the press. And you'd found like at times the, the bigger I was, the more like the stories would paint me out to be not a very nice person or like a, really a, yeah and then obviously when i when i've lost the weight this time around it's very much like i'm the nation's sweetheart i've not changed you know <laughs> i haven't massively changed anything uh, yeah. other than just the way that i look but it, but it is very weird you know it, being an actor in a public facing role you are judged for the way you look probably more than your actual acting abilities <laughs> Thank you to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. You know I have been working with Tracksmith since 2019. And as I have told you, the same items, the first items I got back in 2019, I still use weekly. I still love them. The quality is high, which is why I am so passionate about Tracksmith. Actually, there are many reasons I am passionate about Tracksmith. But this is a big reason because the quality just lasts. It keeps the same quality level throughout the years. Today, I want to tell you a bit about the Lane 5 short tights, which are the shorts that I wore in my 50 mile ultra. I also wore them in my one mile race recently. Um, I wear them all throughout the summer because they, as the name says, they have five pockets for fuel. So I absolutely love these 4.5 inch shorts. Uh, these are for women, but there are shorts that I would check out for the men. Really, they got the longer inseam, the shorter inseam, depending on what you like for men. And this Lane 5, it, these are fast, they're flattering. They have five pockets, as I mentioned, which are ideal for marathons or long runs. They're lightweight. They have this Inverno blend fabric and it just continues to work month after month, year after year. I have absolutely loved these Lane 5 shorts. I have them in three different colors because they are in my regular rotation. I've been using them for years and I love them. You should definitely go check them out. And if you, as a friend of mine, go to tracksmith.com forward slash Tina, uh, you will be able to check out all the things that I really like over there. If you use the code Tina new, if you are a new customer, you can get $15 off your order of $75 or more. And if you are an already a Tracksmith fan, which you will know once you try a Tracksmith, you will see what the big deal is about. I know it's easy to feel like I don't get it. What how, what can be so great about these products? Try it. I You will get it. Trust me. And if you are a uh, previous customer of Tracksmith, if you use the code Tina Give, you will make a donation. You will also get uh, free shipping. I think it's really amazing that Tracksmith does this and makes donations on behalf of customers instead of just, uh, you know, passing that money back to us. It's a great way for us to, to support us, also to support people doing amazing work. Right now it is with Track Girls, but we're probably going to change that code soon to support someone else. So again, go to tracksmith.com forward slash Tina to go check it out. And I want to add at this point, when for US listeners, when you're thinking about like an equivalent, like Colson said, Dallas, or like for me, I always use the example of days of our lives. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's if you would see that as the same. Anyway, um, in US shows, a lot of it, uh, like every character is kind of made up to look like better than the average person does in terms of like made to look like perfection. Everyone it's very dramatic, but it's also very, um, fake. Yeah. Whereas in the UK, the soaps are very like an extreme version of real life in terms of how many like murders and like, you know, things that are going on in this one confined area. But, um, it's very much like real people. Um, and so, um, I always appreciated that about English shows in that, like they, it was very reflective of actually what society looked like, um, rather than in American shows, particularly the women always have the same hairstyle. It's that like swirl, um, curl, you know, like with the curling tongs and, and all the men look very much the same and, or, or unless it's kind of the joke and it's like the, um, you know, that textbook guy who can't get the girl, you know, that kind of stuff. But, um, I really appreciate that about UK shows, but at the same time with that, that makes it very easy again for the press to like poke fingers at people. Um, because I mean, it feels very authentic and, and real people. Um, so then 
let's move on to during the pandemic, um, you took up running. Yeah. How did that come about? Literally. Um, so like I say, I, I, I started acting when I was 11. And I'd been on Corey since I was 12. So the pandemic was the first time in like my entire life that I can remember where I didn't have a job and I didn't have any responsibilities. And I was living in a flat in Manchester, which is where we filmed the show. And we kind of Did got they this, pause filming. Yeah, we, we got an email one night that basically just said, "Look, we're we're really sorry, but it's it's not going to be safe to continue." So, oh wow! And, and okay. beca- because we're all self employed, it was basically our advice from the government is that we look at this again in three months' time. But you know, we, we're def- we're definitely off air for three months. So I kind of remember ringing my mum and I was like, what do I do? And my mum was like, well, if you're coming home, you need, probably need to come home today because I don't know what's going to happen in regards to travel and stuff. Because obviously it was a very scary, weird mm. time. And and I mm-hmm. did, you know, I, I just drove home and went back to my parents from then on and had lockdown there. And I kind of woke up the next, it was almost as I was driving home actually from Manchester. And I was like, do you know what? I'm not going to let this like, I'm not going to use this as an excuse or an opportunity to like go backwards in life. Like this is probably, it's the first time I've not had a job. It's the first time I can just Mm. do things for myself. And, you know, I I, I want to use this time. And that was when- You were aware of that while you were driving? Yeah, literally. As I I was driving back home, that was kind of my thought process was, you know, everyone in the country is going to use this as an excuse. And I'm not, uh, you know, I want to use this as kind of a massive opportunity. And I think the next day I kind of just went out on my first run and it it was really hard. And then, yeah, just, just was like, right, well, if I do that every day, you know, I'll I'll be all right. So tell us about that first run. The the first run that I remember I did um, very early in the morning and I wore a hat and I wore like a snood (laughs) almost up to the top of my eyes because I didn't want anyone to see me or... (laughs) To think, <laughs> what, what's he doing? Why is why is he going? Wait, so out? It, was, it was more about that than about COVID. It was yeah, just yeah, yeah. no, like, it, not it, it, no. Okay. This was more. I don't want people to see me running. Like, I, yeah, right. couldn't think of anything worse. And um, it was. I think I ran two miles in about twenty four oh. minutes, and that That's was like the first, for first time run. that I went out. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually really impressive for a first. And when was the last time you would have run before that? Um, I I ran the Manchester 10K for charity probably when I was 16, 17. Okay. Um, and that 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 was kind of, that that was just one of them things where me and 40 of the people rocked up and all all ran mm. it together with no training. So that that will have been like <laughs> yeah, but I, I kind of mark that run that I've just told you about as my first conscious yeah. i'm gonna you know i'm gonna start running to run run mm. and what did you notice uh, as you kept going with this i mean that's a solid place to be starting um i'd love to hear some reflections on that early period i mean i'm sure you know with the focus on on your weight or losing weight was a big was a big maybe a draw to running was a point, a thing of where you were thinking, oh, I, you know, I'm going to prove them wrong or whatever, but what did other thoughts start to creep in of like, this actually makes me feel good or, or what was going through your mind? I would suggest for the first six weeks, it was only just to lose weight. Literally as I was running, the conversation that I was having with myself was, if you do this, you will lose weight and everything will get better. And it was, it was literally like, mm. you know, it was probably quite a weird conversation that I was having with myself every time I went out for about six weeks. And then one day I was out running and I kind of went, what do I want to do today? And I, I made a to-do list in my head. And then I, I, on this run, I'd, and I think I'd gone out for like 40 minutes this time and I'd made this to-do list in my head and I was like, I want to do this, I want to do that, and then I'll do that. And I was like, great. And then I'd finished and I was like, that was different. And I was like, because that wasn't necessarily about just finishing it and I'll lose weight. That was like for something else. And then that was kind of the turning block where I was like, ah, actually it was all right. That didn't mind it. Like got something else out of that. 
and and then it just slowly turned into something that I was like, I wonder if I could do this. I wonder if I could do that. And by the end of lockdown, which which was literally, you know, I think I think it was about two and a half, three months. I, you know, I, I'd, I'd kind of, I was running half marathons and stuff just because I was like, well, what's next? What's next? And just kept pushing myself. But by the end of it, uh, like at that, there was that point where I decided that I wasn't doing this, you know, I was doing this for me now and I wasn't doing it for the reason of, losing weight like I decided I was almost a runner I love hearing that and I hope you at least consider yourself that now you definitely are in the runner runner category right yeah no. now yeah, Do, yeah can you say that I I'm a runner okay yeah, good. yeah I am a runner now definitely it didn't yeah. it didn't actually looking back on it it didn't take me that long to be like good to, to be invested in what I was doing because from from literally disguising myself from my first ever run, I reckon if if you went two months later, I would I would be telling people that oh well I just need to go for a run and then I'll do that. So it, it, it didn't. It, I I lost every inch of embarrassment about it quite quite quickly. Really looking back. So how how quick did you remove the face covering so that people could? When did you feel like yeah that you could go out and allow people to see you or, or take a picture of you running? Probably a, 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 a picture of me running still now is like that. Even that now is still something that would like. If, if ever I ever get stopped when I'm running, I'm always like, I'm really sorry. I'm I'm sweaty or like it's just it's not the time sort of thing. Or like I just I just keep running and pretend that I've I've not heard them because I'm like that. That's kind of makes me anxious just thinking about it. But um, mm. yeah, like I kind of I I kind of I, I didn't mind people seeing me running after like after that kind of six week mark where I was like, nah, I'm, I'm doing this for me now. Like, you know, what, it doesn't matter what people think. Like I'm, I'm out here doing it. And I think you work out that that is kind of people's attitude. And the weird thing about lockdown for me was it was quite a good time for me personally, like in that kind of self-development bit of everyone yeah. you would see, I was seeing the same people every morning, like, they were obviously in their routines as well. Like they, they didn't have work. So it, it kind of got friendly and everyone kind of cared more about each other. So I, I kind of started to run in a time where everyone was really supportive of each other. So if I remember the first picture that I put on Instagram, having started running and for me, I just put that picture on and that was just how I looked that day. And it wasn't, it wasn't anything, but I basically put on a thing and I was like, I've been on a run. It's a bank holiday like let's just make the most of this crap situation basically and then i remember checking my phone like two hours later and i was like oh my god like it was like front page of the daily mail like it was everywhere and it it was the same period of time that like adele had started to lose weight as well so it was like they were just pitting me and her up as like the poster people sort of thing for <laughs> lock, lockdown fitness motivation, which I obviously hated. But then at the same time, looking back at it, I was like, it was probably the best time it could have ever have happened because people mm. were, it, it was a friendly time, weirdly. Every, everyone was in the same situation. It's interesting, isn't it? Because um, especially with your past, um, of you saying, you know, maybe yo-yoed a little bit before like trying to do it in a, in a more unhealthy way, rather than like you said, this, in this situation, doing it for yourself. So with you, with Adele, um, I mean, Jonah Hill is another person that comes to mind. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost can feel like people kind of like people, what they think as they are, as they think of them, like, yeah, Jonah Hill, Adele are definitely, I, again, I don't live in the UK, so you're not someone that comes to mind for me, but, um, you know, they're, the people want them to stay that way. And then when they do make this lifestyle shift, real, realize that they deserve more. Like I just watched an amazing documentary on Jonah Hill. I don't know if you've seen it, the uh, Stutz, I think his name oh, is, it? On is on Netflix. I haven't seen it yet. No, I haven't seen it. Oh, so I've heard good lots. about yeah. his, um, yeah, psychiatrist, psychologist, I'm not sure which, yeah. um, but Jonah talks about realizing how he deserved better, but then it feels like the media is like then holding that those people up, like, look at what you, in this example for you, look at what you could have been doing 
doing in COVID. Look what you should have been using your time for, which makes other people feel like, oh, well, I'm just a piece of shit because I wasn't able to use this time. Look at what they did and I couldn't. So again, it's making people feel further down, but then it almost feels like it gets to a point where people are like, oh, Adele, she's gone too far. Now she's obsessed with the way she looks. Da, 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 da. Like, and it feels like you almost can't win. There's this like tiny sweet spot, like you said, where you become a bit of a sweetheart of like a poster child. But then regardless, you can't win. And I don't know if that you are obviously in this, but that's what it seems like to me. Yeah, like definitely you can't win. And I think having, you know, at that time, I'd obviously previously lost weight and put it back on again. So I, mm. I, I kind of knew that, that they, you, you basically, I was getting applauded for not looking like the way that I looked in my head. And then yep. I knew that how come no one ever said this when I was putting weight on? Like, so it was a very, it was a very weird thing. And it, it, it took mm. me kind of a long time to get around. And I, I, you know, I have a bizarre relationship with, you know, the press and being in the public eye anyway, because I'm, I'm fully aware of, you know, all, all, all the good they do for, you know, for my industry, I would guess is, is, is the best way of saying it. But then I also, mm. and you know, I, mm. I don't particularly enjoy being famous. Like I, I'm very much live a normal life and I absolutely love my job and going to work is the greatest thing. And the fact that my job makes me famous is a is a bit of a weird relationship because I still mm. have all my normal school friends, et cetera, et cetera. But what I found was that that when people were saying, well done for not looking like the way that you did, I kind of couldn't ever get my head around that because for me it was like, that's just how I look right now and I'm nowhere near where I want to look. I was like, I've not lost, in my head I hadn't lost any weight because I was like, I knew what I was at and I knew what I could have been and knew what I wanted to be because if you look around at what people look like on Instagram or if you look at what so-and-so looks like or so-and-so looks like, you know, it, you're never, ever finished. So I, I sure. kind of had radio silence for like the, the my first year and a half of losing weight. I didn't say a single thing about it to anyone. Like it was kind of, it, it got to a point where I had to make a documentary to kind of, settle scores in a way because everything else had just been made up and like I remember once I, I made a joke because I, I I'm I'm quite I'm quite good on like interviews and getting around stuff and I'd been asked um on a red carpet I'd been asked about um losing weight and I made a joke about how yeah well I was worried because I know in lockdown they had conversations about me having to wear a fat suit when I came back just as like a complete casual passing comment joke and then obviously that was the headline in the paper for like mm. the next week was that um, he's, I'm going to have to wear a fat suit when I go back. And then it, it, it was really weird because they, they kind of pulled stuff from previous interviews. Like there was a period of time where this was even before, before lockdown, I'd been on a holiday in Thailand and I'd got food poisoning and I'd spoken about how I had food poisoning in an interview. And they basically said, Colson's lost all this weight through food poisoning because it was the only thing I'd ever said about losing weight. So it kind of, it, that, I just allowed myself to get wound up. And basically one day the, my press mm. officer at Corrie was like, look, we, we can't keep saying no to talking about it and doing interviews because I need you to do interviews about work and it's affecting it because you need to talk about storylines and Corrie but they only want to know about this and that. And I was like, right, I've got a plan. Let, let me do it. And I then went and made a documentary, which was like, right, that's my, that's my one thing on it. And then I'll never speak to you ever again about it. And it kind of, it kind of worked a treat in a way, like for me, cause that mm. was me telling my truth and I did it once and they, they had everything that yeah. they wanted in that one interview. And I was comfortable with everything I said in that. And that was that. Yeah. You got to do it your way yeah. rather than it being their way. Okay. I'm curious now with at this point, so how many years on are we? Two, three? Um, two. 2020. Um, about three years. Uh, over three years, yeah, which is crazy. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of what you said there, and I want to add some some points here from myself in that, you know, I've, I, again, I don't know what you do and don't know here, but like one of the things I'm most known for is actually quitting running, like less than a year after I ran for GB, um, a few months after I ran my PB in the marathon, like I, I quit. And a lot of that was my body wasn't functioning correctly 
um, because I wasn't eating enough. Um, because I felt like I wanted to look like everyone else. And of course I did look like everyone else. Um, I mean, the way I look now is like what everyone else looked back then, but in my head, I was the big one always was. Mm. And so, um, I struggled with that too. Um, and over the last few years, since I've had my not few years, five years, since I've had my kids, I've really been doing that self-reflection, working on what running means to me beyond, as you said, when you were thinking about, if I do that, if I run this, then that's weight loss. I would literally be like, Oh, if I run an extra mile, that's a hundred more calories I can eat. Like I was having these conversations too. And as you know, when I was at the peak of my career, um, but recently it's been, I've really developed this just like love and appreciation for my body and running and everything. So where are you at now? Because I've got to imagine that's so much harder for you to have these conversations with yourself when regardless of what you're doing, there's people following you and paying attention to you. Um, so what, what is your relationship with running in your body at this point and the way you see yourself now? I actually think I am in quite a good position with it. Like I kind of use running as a tool more than anything, but it is something that I now kind of just have to do. So, you know, Mm. I I kind of, I'm less, obviously I'm post marathon, so it's a little bit different, but I'm less disciplined (laughs) on how much I am having to run in the week. And I'm, you know, I'm less disciplined around, what I'm eating sort of thing. Cause I kind of feel like running allows me the freedom to, you know, do what mm. I want. And I also enjoy it now, which that, that, so that's kind of, I'm in that sweet spot of, it's not a chore to do. I want to do it. And it gives me the freedom to be able to have fun and live the life that I've now become comfortable with because my kind of eating habits have got better. Like I, I was, I was very much, um, like a restrictive eater. So I, I wouldn't, Mm. I wouldn't necessarily eat at all. And then I would eat like three meals in one go. And then this was before you started running. Yeah. So then I would kind of, after I'd done that, like out of embarrassment and annoyance Mm. as a punishment, I would punish myself and I would then be like, right, well, I'm, I'm not going to eat again. So then I wouldn't eat for another day. And then I'd be that hungry that when I do eat, I was absolutely Mm. starving sort of thing. And I kind of, that, that was a cycle that I would get into. So sometimes it's weird. Like if I, if ever, if I go for a long run and when I get back, I'm like absolutely starving or I think, oh, I've gone for a long run. So I better get some food in and I would eat more than I normally would. Like at times I'm always like, oh, I need to be careful here. But I actually find Mm. now that the balance that I have between, you know, my, my gym, my running, my food, my work life, my personal life, my routine, like I, I, I actually feel like I'm in quite a lot of control there, which for now is a, is a very good thing for me. Cause I kind of, I don't know if I ever felt like that was going to happen. Friends, we are a month and a half away from the release of Becoming a Sustainable Runner. And if you care about me and you care about this podcast and you care about our planet, if you are a runner and you care the best way you can support me as a listener of this podcast, as someone who appreciates what I share is going to pre-order Becoming a Sustainable Runner. And I know it feels like your one purchase doesn't matter, but all of those purchases that go through before release all add up to the first day of sales, which means you help us jump to the top of the rankings list, which gets more attention on it, which means it gets recommended in other places. This is honestly one of the best things you can do to support us. Becoming a Sustainable Runner, which I co-wrote with Zoe Rome, is a practical guide for runners of all abilities, all backgrounds. If you want to take meaningful action to protect our planet through your love of support, we are going to bring together personal stories, research, expert input. We're going to show how every runner, that's you, can better support your journey and how you can extend those lessons into environmental action, into community action, into taking care of your own body better so that it lasts and it's able to run for a long time. This approachable book has training tips, takeaways for beginners, for elites. We're going to show you how to approach your training in a sustainable way so you can be a runner for life if you, of course, want to. It's going to serve as a useful guide to help you take meaningful and effective action. And I really think we make a compelling case for not just how 
to do the right thing, but why? So that all of us can connect our love of running to the landscapes and the people and the communities that we love. If you go to becomingasustainablerunner.com, you can put in your email and you can get 50 beyond running sustainability tips, which is probably a lot of what you're looking for. If you're looking for what can I do to be sustainable, you want a checklist box, uh, there is 50 of those there for you at becomingasustainablerunner.com. You can also see who has reviewed the book, like Malcolm Gladwell, Reshma Saljani, Simran Jeet Singh, Darren Olin. Uh, you can see Kara Goucher has uh, left a review. Uh, we have got some amazing reviews on there. Also, all the links to all the places you could buy it. So Target, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Bookshop, Waterstones. And I encourage you, actually, if you want to help in this situation, this is the only time I will say this, uh, in this circumstance, Amazon is actually the best place for you to probably get it for us because that is going to really, really help us move up the rankings. So I know I typically don't recommend Amazon, but in this circumstance, this really helps us out. Go to becomingasustainablerunner.com. Would you say it's control or would you say it's a lack of control? Because it almost feels like before you were trying to control it, right? And you were trying to grip so hard. And again, I say this because I know this not quite a day where I wouldn't eat, but it would be like, okay, you ate too much at dinner last night. You're going to eat really healthy today. Um, and I feel like now it's a lack of control to where, like you said, after you finish a run, it's not like, okay, well, you've been really good and got that run in. So you're going to, you know, do this and do that. You're like, actually, I'm really hungry. So I'm going to actually feel my body. So I wonder, and I'm curious for you, if you agree here, like it's almost a lack of like con being controlling that you've got, it sounds like you're getting to a point where you respect yourself enough to know that if your body is hungry, it needs fuel. Yeah, de definitely that. Like, I think know knowing that knowing that you kind of do have to eat to fuel yourself to be able to do what you, you want to do that mm -hmm. that that is something. And it's kind of you know, it's not it's not that food is a reward for running. It's more that food is something that I have to do to be able to run. And like, if I do go out and do a long run you know, I probably then need to eat a lot of food. Otherwise I'm just not going to recover. And so I, I, I think it probably, you know, I, I think what you're saying like echoes completely for me there. Like for example, this morning, like I went out for a run and it's quite hot in England at the moment. So I kind of went out for a run before breakfast and I was really struggling and I was like, well, I've not eaten. And it makes such a difference. Like I, mm -hmm. I used to run fasted all the time and I was like, just felt crap and felt like quite low energy. And I was like, well, I've not eaten. So like I deserve this to be like a bad run. And then I got in and like had some lunch and I was like, yeah, that's better. But you know, it, the, the more organized you are with your food and your meals, the mm. easier it makes it all for yourself, doesn't it? Yeah. Colson, I just want to take a minute to I mean, honestly, that is an incredible transformation. I'm not talking about physically, mentally to have gone from all that you've said, all that you've passed, all these, uh, you know, conversations that were happening around you, not being a runner, becoming a runner, finding this relationship you've got with running and just honestly, it is an incredible transformation what you've done mentally to have this relationship with running and yourself and recognize what you deserve as a human being, as a good, good, genuine person in this world. I just want to take a minute for that. Cause like it's, that's really impressive and not everyone gets that point that quickly. And I can only imagine how many people are inspired by you, not just through the changes that you've been able to make physically, but like just seeing how well-rounded and wholesome this approach is. So thank you for sharing that. I really, I hope you take some time to celebrate what you have done because it really is impressive. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Not good at taking compliments. <laughs> no, it, it, <laughs> you can work on that. It, it, That's British. <laughs> it, 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 it is, it is one of them weird things, but like I've, the thing that I have <laughs> found and the thing that I'm kind of proud of myself for most is I can acknowledge that running changed my life. So it's like people are like, oh, you must like, they'll talk to me in the streets. And I'm like, you must feel so much better for losing that weight. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like don't want the conversation. If someone tries to talk to me about running, 
I will openly <laughs> talk about the fact that it was it was running that changed my life because it's not, you know, mm-hmm. if you'd have just, if I'd have woke up one day and you'd have taken the weight off me and I hadn't have done anything for it, like it wouldn't have done anything. But the the mental approach that I now get from running, like the clarity that when I run, like I, I organize, I just, you just have a conversation with yourself, don't you, for however long yeah. and you sort out all the stuff that you need to sort out. If you're having a bad day, if you're having a good day, if you're celebrating a moment, if you're upset about a moment. And I think if it wasn't, if it wasn't for the fact that it was running that kind of got me to the point of losing the weight, it would have never been a conversation. So, it, you know, it, it, it started off about losing weight and very quickly the losing weight was absolutely irrelevant for me. And I think that mm. that's the bit that I've enjoyed the most is that, you know, I was always going to get to where I got to as long as I enjoyed this journey of running that I have done. Mm, I love hearing that. So then let's go on to get back to where we were with the marathon. So where did, when did, when and how did a marathon come into the picture? Cause you've said that that's kind of the pinnacle, but how did it, how did that come about? I was on a run one day and I kind of, I, I was from my parents, which basically Manchester for the American listeners is flat. It is like the flattest place you could possibly ever imagine. So if you see my runs on Instagram, just add at least two minutes onto all of them because it is flat. Whereas <laughs> when I'm at home with my parents, it's more countryside, it's more up and down. So obviously it's, it's a bit more challenging. And I was on a run once from home and I got to about 36K completely accidentally. And I looked at my watch and I was like, I need to be careful here because the last thing I want to do is just run a marathon on a random Tuesday because you know, I, I almost do it as accidental because I don't think it's worth doing. <laughs> so I then kind of started having these conversations with myself where it was like, right, well, I'll, I'll, I will do a marathon, but I don't want to put the pressure on myself of doing one. So I was like, well, I definitely won't do one in England then. Cause I had a big conversation about doing, um, the London one with Flora, who's like mm. a butter company that sponsor it. Mm-hmm. And it was a big thing about me doing the London one. And at the time I actually really liked the campaign. Like it, it, it would have, it would have completely ticked the right boxes because it was about inspiring people to run. So I thought, yeah, perfect. Like, let's do that. And then this time round, when I've actually booked, when I actually booked Stockholm, I was like, let me just book somewhere where I can go. I can just do it. I can just enter as a normal person. I can just run and it, whatever happens, happens and it, it doesn't matter. So I kind of texted my mum one night and I was like, I've just booked Stockholm Marathon in June. Like I'd, I'd like you and dad to be there and obviously my, my sister as well. So that, and it was kind of that. So I just kept it a very small family thing. And then mm. w- when I started, I found it weird because – I share quite a lot on my Instagram about my running because I'm now as well known for running as I probably am for Corey because, you know, it it, it did quite a lot for my profile and I enjoy talking about running like I I just do now. Um, And I obviously hadn't posted anything for like five weeks and people were like, oh, what's going on? Like, are you injured? Blah, blah, blah. So I went, do you know what? I'm just, I'm going to put it out there that I'm doing it. So I put out that I was doing the Stockholm marathon. And then I did like a few videos where I was talking about like my training, just, just did really little stuff, but never once spoke about time. So I was like, I'll just put it out there that I'm doing it. And everyone can kind of, you know, it, you know, just, just, just see it. But and then the thing that I knew in my head was, which was constantly in my head. And I remember telling my, um, my friend in the gym this, I was like, if I have a bad run, a journalist is literally going to search my name in race results. And if I've, if I've done it in a time that I don't want anyone to know, they're going to know. So I was like, (laughs) and it's like, so that external pressure that I had on myself where I was like, I could, you know, what if I get, did not finish? Like they're they're gonna know. Mm -hmm. So it was a really, that, that was the only weird thing going into it about people knowing that I was doing it. Yeah. And that is a hard thing um, because, we, you know, with anyone really. But I will say, I don't, I mean, with you, maybe it is a little bit different in that the the press probably, if they knew you were doing it, would want to do something. Um, but I do think sometimes we over-exaggerate 
um, how much we think people are thinking about oh, us. hundred percent, um, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember fit, like, you know, finishing these races and being like, Oh, everyone's going to know everyone's going to be looking it up and they're like, Oh, what happened to her? Uh, when in reality, maybe like one, of, I don't know, a handful of people looked up yeah. how I did. And, and those people probably were like, Oh, I hope she's okay. Or yeah. like, ha ha, she had a bad race. And in which case I don't want those people in my life anyway. So what do they matter? Um, but yeah, uh, that is, this, it definitely is challenging with running. There is no hiding around it. Um, and you talked, I'm going to now point people towards you. You reflected a lot on your marathon, um, in your podcast, which we haven't mentioned yet. Sofa Cinema Club and Sally on my team here at Running For Real absolutely loves your podcast, <laughs> um, which you host with your fellow uh, Corey. Um, what would they be? Co uh, what do you call them? Co-actors? Actors, co co-stars. Co-stars. Yeah, co-stars, co-stars, that's the word. Co-stars, Ben Price and Jack P. Shepard. Um, and uh, you talked about your marathon in that. And I told you before we started recording this, it was quite funny because Jack clearly has never yeah. been involved in the running world whatsoever. Yeah. So it's interesting hearing uh, Ben who has maybe had some relationship with running and then Jack just like completely clueless yeah. uh, was a good example of like an average family member who is yes. trying to wrap their head around what you're doing. Yes. Um, but you talked about it there. You talked about how you struggled um, coming in, kept having cramps. And actually one interesting thing when you, I heard you talking about having cramps coming in, usually when people say they had cramps in the marathon, anytime after 18, 19 miles, I'm like, nope, you're blaming electrolytes and it's not electrolytes. Um, but in your case, you said it would like spasm yeah. and then stop, which actually is one of the only examples I've ever heard of, of an actual electrolyte cramp. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you the, the struggled with that. that I, the person that I went on record to blame, again, this was kind of a joke, but I semi-blamed Greta Thunberg because, because it was in Sweden and because it was Stockholm, all of the, all the drinks were given in paper cups. So taking water on mm. from paper cups at a station is something that I'd never imagined or never practiced. Mm -hmm. So I found it really, really hard to get mm. to get water on. And then when I cramped up, mm -hmm. I was like, "Oh, how, how do you how do you drink water from a paper cup without stopping?" I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna. This is one of the things that flared up at me. And actually, again, Sally said to me, "I just want to let you know, Colson talked about um, plastic bottles because." you don't know me, but my other thing I'm known for is being an environmentalist. Okay. So for me, the lack of plastic cups made me very happy yeah. when I see that. And I actually work with like the Chicago marathon, the New York marathon on their sustainability team. So I am gun ho for those compostable cups. Yeah. Um, however, I will show you, and maybe I'll record a little video that will show you how to go about it because I will agree if you haven't drunk out of a plastic, uh, a paper cup before, it is very hard. You end up choking a, a lot yeah. of it down. It goes all over your face. All over. Um, <laughs> it is very difficult. So that there's uh, this like pinching. You have to make it into a V. Yeah, make it into a kind of funnel. It. Is that yes? Yeah, I, I was like kind a, of you, looking you around to see what other people thumb. would do it. Yeah, yeah. But there still isn't an easy way to do it. I would always encourage people to slow down, even to a walk to drink it and then yeah. run again over trying to run through and keep those precious seconds. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm afraid with, with global warming, climate change being here, uh, you, the, the, the plastic bottles are going to continue to fade away. Yeah. Like, um, London still has plastic water bottles, but I don't think that's going to last much longer. Um, so, um, <laughs> So yeah, I definitely, I'm going to give you a tutorial on that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, it is a challenge, but that said the salt side of things, I think you mentioned your sister and dad was very sweet, ran up ahead and gave you some, uh, do you say it was some kind of sports drink? 
They um so my, my, my sister and my dad kind of they, they were very they were very good. I had written on my hand. I had written on my hand my splits for my first half, and then I had mm. um that I would I was gonna I was looking out for them between fifteen and sixteen and thirty and thirty one. So I basically said to them, if you can get between them points and give me more gels, that'd be amazing. And it, I ended up seeing them loads because they just they 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 got around, which was great. But when I saw them at between. I think I ended up seeing them between 32 and 33 and I just saw them and I was like, I'm struggling here and I don't know why. And I said to my dad, I was like, have you got any water? And he gave me his bottle of water that was like lukewarm because it had obviously been in the back of his Mm. pocket. And I was like, that's, that's bad. And I was like, right, I'll see you at the finish. But I, I, I ran on and then about three or four K later, th- they were there and they, they'd got me a bottle of water and they put in two um, electrolyte tablets mm. in it. And I, okay. I, I, I ran with that. I think that's that. probably more your problem. Yeah. I, I ran with that and that, that helped a lot, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is, um, and maybe that is the way that you go about it. Like you can get these handheld bottles. Yeah. You'd have, you'd have to get used to carrying it in your hand, but. Um, you could have them meet you at a certain point. Well, like, you know, they could meet you at the halfway point and then you start carrying the handheld or something. Yeah, because I kind of, that that that's what I, from it being my first marathon, these were kind of the things that I learned. Because at first my sister, mm. who's a non-runner, was like, what do you mean we're giving you gels? You can take your gels with you. And I was like, no, I can't. I was like, I, I, I can take, I could take three, maybe four. But I was like, anything more than four, like I'm, it's going to annoy me. And she was like, grow up. So it's kind of, I was having those conversations like in the build-up with I'm my family. I'm kind of with her there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was like, everyone else is like wearing fanny packs and backpacks. And I was like, no, I was like, I'm not doing that. Um, I was like, that's why you're here. I've, I've, I've got you, you're my team. But I think in future, if, oh. I, if I had them and I knew they were going to be as good as they were, I'd have mm. said to them, well, can you, can you stand by with some water and electrolytes for me in a, in a mm. bottle that I can keep giving them back sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. I will say, if you ever do run London, don't expect them to be that's, able to get anywhere. That's what they said. They were like, <laughs> they'll a, get to one place and that'll yeah, be it. <laughs> they were like, it's a good job at Stockholm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, London is uh, impossible to get more than maybe two, if you're lucky, get two um, interactions with family members. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, you came in, you took some time to reflect how about now when you look back um on the race on the experience on this growth journey that you've been on yeah what are some thoughts moving forward here now i now i honestly i am proud and like i I, we said before we started about how i was annoyed at myself for having run a marathon having run my first Mm -hmm. marathon and being annoyed about the the like lack of buzz and the feeling that I had after it because I was like I was like oh so ungrateful Colson like what you know you you deserve to kind of enjoy and celebrate that moment and I have in in my downstairs toilet I have um I have a board that's 5k pb 10k pb etc (laughs) etc and when I went to write the marathon time I was like am I writing my chip time or am I writing the time for my watch because because I ended up running a quite, you know, I ended up running about an extra mile mm. and I was like, what do I put here? What do I, do I put what my watch says or do I put my chip time? And I was like, oh, just, I, it doesn't matter. Like I've, I've, I've done yeah. it. I can just, so, so now I'm like, yeah, I, I did it. And if people say, oh my God, you did a marathon. How was it? I'm like, yeah, it, 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 it was good. And I can have the conversation. I don't sound like a spoiled child. <laughs> which is a normal reaction and i think most runners listening have had some kind of experience like that where you got ahead of yourself you had something in mind it didn't come true yeah. and then you took a while to before you actually said you know what <laughs> even if i didn't get my a goal i still am really proud of what i did as you should be yeah is there anything else you want to share today based on our conversation, anything you didn't get to say or just would like to share with anyone who maybe is somewhere along the journey that you're taking now? I, I think j- just like the, the key thing that I have learned and the thing that changed my complete enjoyment for running is the reasons that I was doing it. You know, when I was going out and I was running for, you know, losing weight, I wasn't enjoying it. 
as soon as I made the conscious, you know, as soon as I worked out that I was actually running for me, that mm. that's what changed it all. I love that. The unfortunate thing with that is people, that's something that has to be for you. So those of yeah. you listening, like it might not be the same reasons as Colson. It's probably not going to be the same reasons as me, but like there's something in there as to why this means a lot to you. Um, and you are the only one that can figure out what that is. Um, yeah. And so, and you'll spend probably some figure time, out on a run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say, spend some time in the quiet or spend some time on a run without any headphones on, and it'll probably yeah. come to you. <laughs> um, well, Colson, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your vulnerability and sharing with us and just. Yeah, being such a beacon of light for people um, and, you know, just showing that you can have a healthy relationship with yourself, even if you've had a really, you know, maybe not traumatic, but difficult time in the past with with your body, relationship with your body and, and how people view you. So thank you so much. I, I just appreciate you a lot for, for sharing this. Thank you very much for having me on and talking about running. It's very rare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Running, running podcast number one. I'm sure there will be many, <laughs> many more. <laughs> Look forward to hearing them. Cheers. The Running For Real podcast and everything we do here at Running For Real would not be possible if it wasn't for the Running For Real team. While I am the person who you hear from most often in the, maybe the face of the brand, the rest of our team are such critical pieces of what we do. And without them, I think I'd just be running around in circles with ideas. So I want to take a moment to thank our team. To Jeremy Nessel, who's been with me since the very beginning. Kat McKay, Sally Pontarelli, Kelsey Wang, Sandy Gutierrez, Louise Murphy, Andrew Basola, Alexandria Will, and Maria Vargas. Thank you to each and every one of you for all that you give to Running For Real and our community. I appreciate you and I'm so thankful for having you as a part of the team. I loved that conversation with Colson and I hope you enjoyed it too. I hope you will share it with your newer running friends who might still be in that phase of figuring out what running means to them. This was just such an important conversation and I'm really appreciative of his vulnerability, his evolution that he shared with us. I just think that was so important. I want to remind you to go check out the links in the show notes. You can go check out Sofa Cinema Club from there. You can go check out Colson's social media. You can also find links to our sponsors who have made this episode possible by going to runningforreal.com forward slash episode 358. There you will find links to Precision Fuel and Hydration, uh, which is our new sponsor. Very excited about them uh, by going to precisionfuelandhydration.com forward slash Tina. That will auto apply the 15% off coupon code to your order. You can also check out Tracksmith. Go to tracksmith.com forward slash Tina. Or, or you can check out AG1 by going to drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. Uh, again, all those links in the show notes. Nice and easy at runningforreal.com forward slash episode 358. I really appreciate you joining me today. I cannot wait to see you for a together run on Monday, for a for real episode on Wednesday, and for another episode next Friday. I will see you then.